And thank you so much for joining us this morning with the Teaching Center. We are so grateful that Harlan Pease is going to be sharing with us this morning about what I learned from teaching from being a student. And so I'm excited to learn from Harlan this morning as all of us are coming in as students to learn about how to be better teachers. Harlan, I will pass the floor to you. All right. Thank you so much. I, I got to say, I'm a, I'm a little bit nervous here. You know, that first jitters, you know what I mean? So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Let's make sure that works. And there's Heidi. I'm guessing you can all see my screen now. We can. All right. So I'm going to start with a little, we're going to watch TV in a second here, but uh, I wanted to subtitle this. Uh, I tried to learn to be a better chess player. At the beginning of the summer, I made a commitment. I learned the, the rules of chess when I was like 11 years old and played a couple of games against my dad. And uh, my dad always kicked my butt. And I never forgot how to play chess, but I never really learned. So I decided this summer I was going to make a commitment and it really kicked my butt. And made me think about teaching a lot. And so I want to talk about what I learned in the process. But first, let's watch some videos. I know some of you play chess and I know some of you don't. So I thought I'd provide a couple contextual questions for you to think about if you're not a chess player. So some things to think about when we watch these, we're gonna watch about two minutes of two different videos. <laughs> Are we confused? Uh, and obviously your answer to that will be somewhat based on whether you understand chess or not. Can we test on this or find a way to assess learning? Okay. What exactly are we teaching in these videos? And are we confused now? So each of these videos that we're gonna look at are their stated purpose is to teach beginners how to be better chess players. So each of these chess players are grandmasters and they're going and playing beginners, very beginners at the game with the idea that these beginners will make typical mistakes and they can use them as educational experiences. Does that make sense? Okay. So we'll start with Daniel here. Let us begin the speed run, ladies and gentlemen. Let us begin with speed run. And I'm gonna play three minutes and two seconds increment. We've got a 500 for the first game. Can everyone hear that okay? So we're gonna play E5. This is three plus two, three minutes and two seconds. Knight f3, knight c6, everybody's familiar with this line, and he plays the scotch game. Now, the scotch is one of the oldest openings in existence. The idea of the scotch is to immediately contest the center and to open up the bishop. Obviously, we need to respond to the tension in the center. The downside of the scotch is that he has moved the same piece twice in the opening. Why is that bad? Well, part of the reason that it's dangerous to do so is I can develop my pieces and simultaneously attack his pieces while I'm doing that. That is called developing with tempo. He takes my knight. Now, x you see, Charlie against x you see played queen f6, which I'm going to do here. This is Charlie's move against x you see. You actually do not take the knight. This is called an in between move. He plays f3 to defend. I'm actually going to do five minute games, guys. This is going to be too fast. Now, what is the downside of the move f3? What is the downside of the move after you think you for the 500 bits in this line? And how should I take this knight? How should I take this knight? So we're going to stop there. And we're going to look at another. Hey guys, we're about to get into a brand new series called Building Habits, which is my personal take on how to improve in chess, starting from say 400 ELO all the way up to 2000 ELO and beyond. I'm going to choose a series of rules that I have to follow when I'm playing this game, and you guys can follow them too. What you'll notice is you might be missing a lot of opportunities to play winning moves. That's okay. Focus on the fundamentals. What I'm trying to get you to do is build good habits and play high percentage moves that will increase your base. So we got the white pieces. I always have the uh, these things on that tells you where you can move to. Um, I think it's important to know how the pieces move. If you know how the pieces move, you should know pawns move two squares. One of the best ways to start would be e4. That's right, we got the username VBKN. It, it's a tough, no one's gonna know it's me. 
No one's going to know it's me. Uh, I'm real under the radar here, guys. I'm real stealth. So, okay, I've played E4. It's all about controlling the center. My opponent's played G6. To me, he's basically not controlling the center. I don't think it's absurd to play another center move. Two squares as well. Now, my opponent's played knight h6. Based on the rules that I have there, which is basically anything towards the center, I would call a good move, or that's the goal. If I see a move like this, I can already assume my opponent's probably not playing a good move. However, if I touch the bishop, I'll notice I can take that. What I notice is that at the lower levels, Everybody takes things as soon as they can take them. So I'm going to take that knight. Okay, so let's stop there. And we're, we're seeing two very contrasting ways of approaching the same idea. Does that follow for everybody? I, I, I wouldn't say one is better or one is worse. It really depends on context, but there are some really important things we can learn here. So keep those in the back of your mind. Well, actually, um, let me ask, let me get first quick. Was anybody confused by the first video? Yeah. Um, could we test on what happened in the first video? And obviously we've only watched a minute, but I'm just trying to get you thinking about this. And I want you to compare that to the second video where like, could we test on the second video? Absolutely. We've laid out a series of steps for our students. And if they do it, check. And if they don't, X, right? Um, did the first guy know exactly what he was teaching? Chess. <laughs> and the second guy, exactly, Robert, no. The second guy knew exactly what he was teaching. So when I watched those videos, you know, I started out playing chess. Um, I'll talk more about them eventually and how they that evolved, but um, I thought that was really, you know, when I was watching it, the meta teacher of me was like, wow, this, this kid, Amon, and I'm calling him a kid at my age. I was like, if this person doesn't have a background in teaching, he really did an amazing job of laying out a, a, a plan. It's like he backwards designed what he was gonna do, but let's move on here. So, I want to introduce this concept of con cognitive load. You may be aware of it. You may not be aware of it, but it divides. Cognitive load is like the load on our brains when we try to learn something. And there are three sort of branches of this, or branches isn't really the right word, but intrinsic, extraneous, and germane. And let's look at those in more detail. So the intrinsic cognitive load is just the inherent difficulty in learning something. Okay. How hard is it to learn something? So the example I gave was cooking because when I made this PowerPoint, I was hungry. Um, it's, doesn't, it's not much intrinsic cognitive load to learn how to measure and add a half a teaspoon of salt to a recipe. However, learning how to salt a dish so it tastes good is, is a lot more to learn. There's a greater intrinsic cognitive load. For an intermediate example, it's easy to measure it, but if the instructions say it needs to be blended with flour and other ingredients, that's a different level of intrinsic cognitive load than just measuring out. Does it kind of make sense to everyone? All right, I'm just gonna proceed here. Extraneous cognitive load is really just fundamentally, how much work do we put on the brain to understand the instructional methods and the modes of delivery. Are we adding work by the, the learning methodology, if you will, or the instructional methodology? Um, I'm gonna use this term semantic noise more than once. If, if it's a review for you, semantic noise is noise we introduce by using language that the audience doesn't understand, okay? So when we think about extraneous cognitive load, uh, do we have clear instructions? Those of us who talked about tilt, and if you went to the tilt workshop, obviously a big part of tilt transparency um, is reducing extraneous cognitive load. Are we using language that our students understand? Um, have we organized effectively? Uh, the key idea, of course, is 
we have limited resources, cognitive resources. So if we're splitting part of our resources to extraneous cognitive load, we have less available for the intrinsic cognitive load. It's common sense. And then germane has to do with mental models. Um, we have to expend some energy to create mental models to sort of learn scheme or schemata, if you prefer that plural. And, you know, obviously we need to create these mental models so that every time we face a problem, it's not a brand new problem. So our brain needs to split into three different things when we're learning in terms of managing this cognitive load. We need to be creating models, we're learning new material, and we're negotiating the instructional material, okay? So a way to think about models a little more, and I quoted Charles Duhigg here from his book, uh, Smarter, Faster, Better. Reactive thinking is at the core of how we all allocate our attention. For example, athletes, they don't sit there and think, oh, now I'm going to set my, you know, bend at the knees and lift through the feet to make this jump shot. It happens, it happens. Um, so reactive thinking is how we build habits. So if we think about learning through this perspective, there's an intrinsic thing. We need to learn this new idea, this new concept, it's new, maybe it's a memorization. We have an extraneous cognitive load, which has to do with how, are this, how is this material being delivered? How do we negotiate the instructions? How do we understand the person sharing this? And then we have this cognitive load related to creating mental models, which basically create shortcuts. Any questions on that? Does that all make sense? Okay. No response. Yeah. Robert, question. yeah. Um, part of this sounds a little bit, and feel free to correct me. Um, uh, part of this sounds a little bit like learning styles. Am I close on that? Well, I think it's related to learning styles. Absolutely. And connected to that, um, so. A way to connect it to learning styles, Robert, would be if we think about this creating of schema, mental models, that really reflects on our individual learning styles. So using the game of chess would be a great example. For someone who thinks visually, they're going to create mental models based on what it looks like. I'm not much of a visual learner, so I'm creating mental models more on, I'm not quite sure what I'm doing in that case, I'm a bad chess player. <laughs> but uh, but in terms of, um, it, it, learning styles very much connects to the extraneous cognitive load, because if we can teach in a way that more directly reaches that person's learning style, we can eliminate some of that extraneous noise. Uh, right, so I, I, think, I think I was equating it back um, to the previous slide, but I got it. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Lita. You're muted, Lita. I still muted. I think that's a mic problem because she's not. Yeah. Do you want to drop it in the chat, Lita? Let me turn the, let me go to the chat here. Yeah. She said she would come. She said she would come back or she might okay. be typing by the look on her face right now. Okay. <laughs> so it, this is actually great that Robert asked that question because I hadn't thought about this, but you know, I think part of the reason we all we were all so exhausted uh, in spring of 2020 was suddenly we were all faced with a heavy cognitive load of adjusting all of our teaching approaches to being virtual slash online. And um, with all due respect to our administration, uh, there was a lot of extraneous cognitive load. Instructions were changing, expectations were changing, we weren't sure what was going on. Uh, seemingly it, within one day, things were changing. So I think a lot of us were like, blah, 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 uh, which is a nice way to be sympathetic and empathetic for our students. Um, Lita, did you? Uh... Okay. All right. So I'm just going to proceed. And if Lita gets her question in the chat, Amy, will you just interrupt me? Awesome. So we have these three cognitive loads. And you, you can obviously see where this is going. 
what we're thinking about here, but I'm gonna just kind of keep walking along here. So first, chess is a hard game. It's a hard enough game that some very smart people have dedicated their lives to it. And I bring this up, not because I want to be like, oh, I worked at something very difficult to learn, but because everybody in this room, our virtual room, is someone who's a smart person who's dedicated their life to a study. Um, that's why we chose our area of expertise, whether that be philosophy, whether that be history, whether that be business, whether that be mathematics, et cetera, language acquisition. Uh, so that's an important thing. I want you to keep it kind of in the back of your mind is that uh, you know, when we listen to Daniel, Daniel's brilliant. He's a genius. I love his videos, even though most of the time I'm like, wait, I got to slow that down and look at it again. But we should all remember that we are experts. We've de dedicated a substantial portion of our life to mastery. Okay. So as a student of one of these masters, I need to do a bunch of things. I need to allocate cognitive resources to intrinsic difficulties, how the pieces move, the basic rules of the game, the complications of why the pieces move, coordinating the hows and whys of the pieces moving together, coordinating all of that in response to how my opponent is moving and putting it all together to come up with a plan for winning the game. That's a lot of work. I have to say, when I started learning chess and I was really getting focused, like I was exhausted. Like I'd play two games and I'd be like, I feel like I needed a nap um, because my brain was working so hard to keep track of all that stuff. So it's, I think it's good to remind ourselves that we have developed a mastery of our subjects, but our students are experiencing something much more like what I was experiencing. Uh, I literally felt stupid at least twice a day, <laughs> probably more than twice more than normal, I should say. <laughs> um, so in order to do all that stuff, I need to allocate my cognitive resources to nav navigating how the material was delivered figuring out what the point really was. With both of those videos we looked at, and I watched many more than that, um, one, none of them were really good at the point. I actually found this one guy who uh, does a better job than anybody else. He's kind of a wing nut, which also made his videos very uh, entertaining. But then I had to figure out why the point really was important and then apply it. Okay, then, I have to create my mental, mo mental models. I have to recognize patterns, apply concepts, recognize patterns of opportunities that allow me to create a winning advantage, recognize dangerous situations. Okay, so I'm belaboring the point, but it's a lot of work for something that I learned the basics of when I was you know, 11, which was 15 years ago. Um, you know, that, uh, <laughs> um, so I hope we're feeling something, empathy and sympathy for our students, um, really all of our students, because learning something is, it's a lot. It's really a lot. Um, Arlen, there are two wonderful comments in the chat that I just want to pull out. Yeah. says, yes, Harlan, I like to say my neurotransmitters are depleted and it's time for a break. I think we can all feel that often throughout the semester, but we know our students do the same. And Marla says she uses a lot of stories in my class to help students create the schemas using the sociological concepts and theories. We can also look at schemas as strategies. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I mean, we could do an entire semester on just how to, I mean, relating to Marla's comment, relating to Robert's comment, um, how we can help students create schemas in different ways. Um, but yeah, uh, so I think it's important to, like I said, to take a little break for sympathy and empathy, because I know I'm entering this semester with a, a, a different understanding. Um, let's look at this a little more. So <laughs> when you're playing chess, one of the first patterns you lose is what's called scholar's mate. And I didn't know how many people know how to play chess, so I didn't bring it up. But basically, it's this trick. And if you fall for it, you, you're sitting there like, what happened? Uh, you lose in like four moves. So <laughs> you will hopefully laugh at yourself at falling for it. And then you'll most likely fall for it again. So you're going to 
what I did was, I mean, you could obviously Google like how to beat scholars mate. I didn't, it was pretty basic. I'm like, okay, I'll do this, I'll do this. And you figure out a way to sort of beat it. Um, and in honor of our, uh, Mr. George W. Uh, fool me once, shame on you, fool me. You, you can get fooled again. Um, so one thing that I learned very directly was that creating a mental model takes energy and then learning when to use the mental model also takes energy. It's not enough just to learn, it's enough to figure out how to use it. So I figured out what scholars made is and how to prevent it. Um, but then I got engaged in learning how to beat new things like the fried liver attack and so forth. And guess what happens when your brain gets occupied with something else? Uh, <laughs> you, you fall for scholars made again because your brain is limited resources. And this kind of really struck me, like we have students who, I used to be a math teacher. And uh, when you teach students like FOIL, and you remember quadratic equations, first, outer, inner, last, and you teach them that method, and then you teach them the quadratic equation, and they sort of forget FOIL, which is easier, like in many cases, and everything goes into negative b plus or minus the square root of, I don't remember, b squared minus four, whatever it is. I don't wanna embarrass myself further. Uh, so it's, I thought that was an important thing to think about with our students is we might teach them this concept and they'll forget it while they're mastering another concept. And it takes time to review. And I see Lita nodding her head because I think it really, we probably see that a lot when with ESL students or um, where, you know, you're trying to learn this and then you're trying to learn this. Um, another way to think about it is the way children will acquire language. They'll learn the irregular form of a verb. And then when their brains figure out that, oh, when we make a past tense, we use add an ED sound, they'll say some really funny things because they start applying this new rule and it overrides an old rule. So this is learning. Uh, so I learned kind of, Kind of a funny, had some funny, good laughs at myself, along with the you're so stupid comment. Well, anyway, um, so hopefully we're still able to laugh at ourselves and again, have some empathy for our students. Okay, so some things to think about here. Um, it's important to remember that we have these prerequisites in, in place and we think about it, you know, like, as an English composition instructor, for example, I assume that my students can write uh, a sentence. Um, as when I'm teaching a communications class, a prereq is comp one, I assume that my students can cite a source, both an in-text citation and a works cited page. These are assumptions. Um, but it's important to remember, they might make mistakes that just because I've, we'll never forget, hopefully, how to cite a source doesn't mean the student who learned it the previous semester is going to bring it with them. Their brains are going to be busy processing the new semester. And it's worth it to remind them. Uh, one thing I did in my made available to my students is a, just a quick video where I showed this is how you cite a source. And it made a huge difference. Those students who were too embarrassed to say, I don't remember how to do this, or, you know, students will nod their head. Yeah, I got it. I, know how to do it. I don't need a review. And then 90% of them need a review. Um, it's just a good thing to remember that just because students have accomplished a prerequisite doesn't mean they're coming into your class with mastery. Those are achieving a standard to pass a class is not the same as mastery. Okay, that's a really important idea. Um, Charles Duhigg's comment about the athletes. I think this is something to remember, like it, it takes athletes a lifetime uh, it takes athletes a lifetime, well, uh, their active lifetime, I should say. Obviously, they age out of it. But, um, you know, we see, like, if you're a baseball fan, you'll, be, you'll see hitters lose their swing, something they've done their whole life, and then their head gets in, and they, they, they can't swing. Or if you've ever seen the movie The Legend of Bagger Vance, which is a great uh, Stephen Press, Pressfield book, um, and he talks about, like, we all have a swing. The problem is we lose it. Um, so you have to think about this ingrained thing. If you've devoted your life to literature, you're reading it on a funda fundamentally different level. Uh, Robert. Just a quick comment, Harlem. I saw this 
maybe a week ago. Um, Michael Jordan, I'm assuming most people in the room know who that is, or think they know who that is, uh, arguably one of the greatest basketball players of all time. In his career, he, he estimates that he missed over 9,000 shots, but those get forgotten. Um, we all fail. We all need a little extra encouragement along the way. Yeah, that's absolutely. And I mean, that's what, you know, that, that, that's such a great thing to remind students. And if I'm not mistaken, didn't Jordan like not make his college team or something or high school team or yeah. Um, I mean, that's always a, kind of an inspiring thing to remind your students uh, in terms of a fixed versus a growth mindset. Um, every great got there by failing over and over and over again. Um, so uh, yeah, just just kind of remember with your students that they, they do need a re reminder and just because we covered it in week one doesn't mean that they're bringing it with them in week three in the same way that we are bringing it. Um, so if we think about our course objectives and you know how we're building an effective practice with you know uh, maybe formative assessments and giving feedback, um, you know, scaffolding learning, uh, it's interesting. I, I, back when I was in high school, I helped teach a math class with one of my uh, teachers in story for another time. Um, but she used this expression spiral learning. And her idea was like learning is this, you know, spiral and you just kind of, you keep building. Uh, and she talked about something that really wasn't caught up. Well, actually it was codified, I think back in the early 20th century. Um, shoot, I'm going to forget the term, but it's the basic idea that a student can't get to four until they get to three, and they only understand three when they understand two is the idea, this idea of scaffolding something. So it's important for us to remember these concepts, and obviously it's complicated. That's what makes our job really difficult, is we have a very diverse group of students with different skill levels, uh, but that's a topic for another time. We'll just take baby steps here. Um, so you made me aware that as a teacher, I'm not really aware of the mental models I, I use often, okay? And I'm gonna give you an example. Um, so I used to be a guitar teacher. And by the time I started teaching guitar, I'd been playing quite seriously for uh, eight years, give or take, seven or eight years. So you have these beginning students and you're like, you know, okay, put your finger here. And it just sounds like crap. And you're like, no, no, you, and because you've forgotten all the steps involved in pressing a, a string to a fret. You've internalized it to this level that when you see a student, it, you don't have the toolbox to help that student understand it. And I remembered back, you know, I read this book by Mick Goodrick, uh, who suggested that we press down on the string and just sit there and practice lightening our touch until this note started to buzz and then press back down. And how I used to sit there for like 15 minutes and just practice this really silly thing with all four fingers. And then you need to transfer that. So um, when I recognized I needed to teach it, I had something to draw on, but I wasn't aware my students didn't have that mental model until a number of them had struggled with something that seemed like, well, duh, just press the string down, okay? And I also realized in my teaching, I am completely unaware of some of my mental models. And so I noted before that we're all, you know, we have achieved a level of mastery. And, um, you know, if we have aptitude toward it, which might have been what drew us towards something, we probably really weren't aware so the example I came up with here, um, when, before I mentioned the empathy again, um, we lack a sense of how to teach someone else something we never figured out how to teach ourselves because we sort of got it. Um, and I mentioned language acquisition again. Sorry, I rushed that slide and I don't need to. We're, we have plenty of time. Uh, when we learn language as children, we don't think about it. We just learn it. And up to about the age of five, this, we kind of seem to have this open window. And, people who are exposed to multiple languages will learn them. But obviously, if you try to learn a language and you're 15, it's like, yo, say to say, you're like, you're trying to remember a bunch of crap. It's like, I don't know, tu sabes, I don't remember. It's been a long time. Yo no soy, is that right? Yo no soy. <laughs> um, uh, so 
think about these mental models conjugating a verb. At one level, we learned it without thinking about it. And then later we have to think about it. So if we're trying to teach something, we just sort of know. It can be difficult. So I thought back to when I read my first novel, which was a Lone Ranger book. And the character in the book was much darker than the person I saw on TV. The old re reruns of the Lone Ranger was this guy dressed all in white and, you know, he's very moral and upright. And, and the character in the book was darker. Um, so a cigar smoking character launching quarter sticks of dynamite at a train while masquerading as a Native American was clearly a different person than the all dressed in white Lone Ranger I saw on TV. No one told me to think about characterization. It just, it just was. So when I started teaching literature, I really couldn't empathize, empathize with my students who defaulted to this, who couldn't default to understanding when Hamlet's sitting there saying to be or not to be, that's telegraphing a tremendous amount of stuff about Hamlet and his insecurities, his self-esteem, uh, the way he thinks, the way he overthinks, uh, we could maybe apply a bastard or profile to him. He's more of, an, of a conceptualizer than an implementer. You, <laughs> you could go in all kinds of directions here. Uh, but not everyone has that same mental model of equating actions and spoken things to creating a, a psychological profile. Just as an example. So when I walk into a literature classroom, I had to kind of really restructure and think like, it, it's one of those things where you like, I used to have a boss who yelled at the Brazilian people who worked at us. He'd be like, speak English. And I'm like, Harold, they're not not speaking English to aggravate you. They can't. But he seemed to really struggle with this idea that like these people lived in the United States and didn't work fluent. Um, Harold wasn't a very a cultured person. He was a great handyman, but that's a story for another time. So I had to learn how to empathize. So as teachers, I think a good takeaway is that we really need to reduce our cognitive load, the extraneous cognitive load. Um, we want to free up as much space for our students to focus on creation of mental models. We want to be facilitators, not people who are sort of, I, I hate to use the term gatekeepers because it has so much more, but we definitely don't want our, our teaching to be, and you might think like, well, who would do that? Well, I certainly had teachers who did that. Particularly when I got to grad school, I had teachers who made it difficult to be gatekeepers to sort of like, you're not ready for grad school work unless you negotiate this kind of stuff. And I remember asking my professors questions and getting responses that I would hope I would get fired for giving. They were so incredibly unhelpful and condescending. Um, so you need to think about this. Um, remember when we create instructions that we are creating them through the lens of our own mastery. We, we, this is, we have our models in place. We read them back and we're like, this makes perfect sense. Uh, I think Audrey's in here. And I remember Audrey asked me to look at a couple of assignments, which was great. It was a great experience. I think for me to read someone else's instructions, but hopefully helpful for Audrey, like, because I'm reading it like, I'm an idiot here in this topic. What does this mean? And stuff like that can be really helpful. Uh, so we wanna free up the, and I would argue it's what our job is about. Um, anyone motivated enough can go on to Google and learn everything I teach in my communication class, everything I teach in my public speaking class and more or less everything I teach in, in my English classes. Um, those of us who learned well from the textbook, I mean, that was pre-internet, we had the same experience. You know, I had, you had certain classes where you just skip class and read the book because you learn more. You would, what you were trying to do was decrease this extraneous. So I would say as teachers, our job is to reduce this um, extraneous cognitive load, okay? This, I mentioned sub semantic noise before, and I'll just repeat it again. We want to make sure we're using language our students understand. And it's not just the words, it's not just vocabulary. It's, you might also think about sentence structure. I tend to think in longer sentences. When I write, I use the semicolon a lot. Um, 
is that helping or is that confusing? Is that one of those places where we're creating sort of a barrier where certain students over with a certain facility of language are like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And other students are sitting there like, I'm not sure what he's saying, but I'm embarrassed to ask. Um, so we think about language semantic noise in more than one way. For what it's worth, even our nonverbals can carry semantic noise for people from different cultures. Uh, they might not read our nonverbals in the same way we intend. And I'm sure all of us have had that experience where a student took something we meant as a joke as like a, they took it the wrong way. Um, so obviously we don't want to be blank slate, and, but we wanna be kind of created a sense of awareness in our classrooms. Um, obviously a culture of asking questions is, is super important. This came up a bit in the, uh, Amy's uh, presentation yesterday about um, the, our responses to the watermark surveys and what it means to feel comfortable asking a question and some cool ideas are thrown out. Uh, when we introduce new terms, it, it's, I think it's important to remember, particularly if they are conceptually fueled, that it's not enough to just be like, oh, semantic noise is noise that's created when people don't understand the, uh, the message. It's important that we, our students actually understand it as a concept. Um, often I tell my students, I don't care about you learning the term as much as I care about you learning the concept. Um, like in cinema class, key and fill lighting is not nearly as important that they remember those terms as they remember key lighting and fill lighting and how it creates shadows and doesn't create shadows on the face and stuff like that. Um, so the distillation, it's really boils down to two questions. Are we being empathetic to the learning process? And are, thus, are we thusly focused on our teaching? Um, are we doing everything we can to kind of reduce this extraneous cognitive load? Uh, so students have time and energy for the intrinsic and the germane. But we also wanna be aware in our teaching process that people are at different stages in the models they're creating models differently, as Robert pointed out. Um, they might need different amounts of time and energy. Uh, I will say that this process really made me think about formative assessments in a wholly different way. Um, if I were doing, if I hadn't had to commit to what I was presenting on back in whenever, I would be doing a session on formative assessments. So I'll probably do that next semester. But uh, so I wanna share just a couple more things. And then I'll take, try to answer questions. I mean, I'm far from an expert on any of this. Um, but one hard lesson that I had to learn is like, it's okay to be average. As the summer went on, I also, one of the things I committed to this summer was learning to play the harmonica. And the discipline of sitting down and studying chess every day and playing games in a disciplined way, not a fun way, became more and more back burner as the summer went on because I got more invested in, I'm gonna go ahead and end this slideshow. I don't think we need it anymore. Um, as I got more invested in playing the harmonica and I got reinvested in writing songs and suddenly I wanted chess to become something I enjoyed uh, rather than something I sat with a book and studied over the, over the board. Um, and that was also very helpful for me to realize with my students. Um, I know Amy and Neely Ann and and myself, I've all had one student who has a lot more aptitude than, than we see. And I remember asking Amy about it last semester and he, she was just like, that, that's just who he is. He's, he's cool with it. He gets a B, he could get an A, he'll take a B. So that was also something that helped me empathize with my students because I tend to really give myself a hard time if I don't, like, like it really took an act of, act of courage for me to be like, you're gonna suck at chess. <laughs> I was not comfortable with that. Um, I want to go back to those two videos very briefly because it would be easy to extract that Aman, who had the very clearly laid out rules, made a better video. And it got really boring. I kept waiting for him to teach me something else. And literally, there are six hours of streaming video of this guy playing the same set of rules before he introduces a new rule. And I'm just like, and he never said why. why. Why is it important to control the center? 
Whereas Daniel is presenting so many layers of information, it's like peeling an onion. So I go back and I watch Daniel and I learn something. And then I go back and watch it again. And I'm not saying one is necessarily better, but it's very important to be contextually aware where your students are. And this again is where formative assessments really got me thinking about this. Like I don't use formative assessments enough in my teaching to assess my students learning and give them feedback. And that's something I really started thinking about like, how do I know whether I'm being Daniel or Amon if I don't know what my students are thinking? And I know, I'm gonna throw myself under the bus. I'm more Daniel than Amon. I'm the person who's like, oh, and this reminds me of something else and blah, 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 blah. And 15 minutes later, my students like, can we get back to this topic? A uh, bit of an exaggeration, but not. Um, so this experience, uh, you know, I would, I would encourage any of you to, to join me for a game of chess. I know Yanush and I are going to play at some point once we, once the semester rolls out. But uh, I felt very enthused about being a teacher from really putting through myself through sort of the discipline of being bad at something and trying to get better at it. Next up, maybe I'll try to perfect my foul shots or something. <laughs> anyway, does anyone have any questions at all? Comments? I'm going to look at the chat. Well, Harlan's catching up on the chat. I'm going to drop the feedback survey into the chat chat also to ask for your feedback. I'm going to let Howard speak. So Howard, go ahead. Yeah, Harlan, help me out on what some of us teach. It's important on a different language. Uh, and that is, and I'm not talking about English versus Spanish and all that, even though that's a certain part of it. For instance, if I was to take a math course, I wouldn't have any earthly idea of what any teacher was saying on anything. Um, I'll give an example. I teach law. Robert would have this one too. We kind of assume that everybody in our class already knows what probable cause is. Was there probable cause to uh, search uh, Mar Largo? You know, well, you know, that. We're, we're talking about different language and I've had students and they don't tell me at first, the second, third week to say, well, wait a minute, this is learning an entirely new language here. So anybody, anywhere, whatever, help me out on, uh, I don't know how, how to start on something like that. You know, I think first Howard, I would acknowledge, I'm gonna introduce a term that is going to involve some semantic noise and probable cause is a, is a conceptual, a concept. It's a conceptual idea. So I mean, you can Google about a thousand YouTube videos, if not more, of police officers applying probable cause and they don't know what probable cause is. So I, if I were, you know, just getting a little bit away from this, but um, I'm gonna talk about this a little bit with active learning cycle. One thing that really can help with students, help students is to engage the active learning cycle where first you put them sort of immerse them in it. You give them an experience where they have to engage. And case studies are a great way to do that. Uh, and it doesn't have to be like a formal case study. It can be simply an example where, you know, you ask, you show your students a video of a, 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 a law enforcement officer, you know, claiming they have probable cause in a situation. And then you stop and ask them to think, pair, share, uh, small group, engaging questions, you know, give them, because what underneath that need to, to, to excuse me, back up, to eliminate semantic noise, you really need to activate the need to know. And until a student has a need to know something, this is just trying to do rote memorization of a definition, which clearly is how it's hitting with probable cause. So that was my hand slapping my bare knee. I'm wearing shorts. Um, <laughs> it's like a mullet, business up top, party at the... <laughs> um, but uh, and, until we've activated the need to know, just giving someone a rote mem memorization, I mean, they can write it down for you, they can regurgitate it, but they don't know probable cause or reasonable articulable suspicion or, you know, all, all kinds of things like that. And those are great examples. When we get into semantic noise involving an idiomatic expression that has a concept embedded in it. Uh, to, I'm going to ramble on this for just a second. Uh, when, when I teach my students, whether it's 
speech or English that they need to write an introduction, there again, I have a mental model in my mind that's conceptual. And one thing I've learned that's been really helpful from teaching speech classes because they use a rubric that breaks the intro down. It's helped me transfer that skill into English in a way that, okay, first I'm gonna give my students these steps and that's gonna help me help, excuse me, help me help them analyze other introductions. And that's gonna help me help them understand the concept because the word, oh, you need an introduction is embedded with semantic noise. I mean, ridiculous amounts of semantic noise. Anyone who's graded papers is acutely aware of this. Um, so great question. Uh, I think anytime we have a semantic, we recognize that we have a mental model that helps us understand probable cause as an example. It's a good time to bring in active learning cycle and engage in, first I have to give these students an activity so they care. Um, and follow up on that, that's a great place to use a summative assessment. Um, you know, one idea of summative assessments is like the one minute paper or the muddiest point. And what that is, is sort of like an exit pass for students to, you know, what was the uh, you know, one minute paper? What was the key point today? And it gives you a chance to see what, oh, this is what they thought was important. And the muddiest point gives you a chance to see what they thought they didn't understand. Um, those kind of ideas, I think, can be uh, super helpful. That's such a great example that Howard gave us. Uh, I mean, like the, the Supreme Court debates the definition of probable cause in its application. Clearly, our students are going to struggle. Uh, Kirsten, um, yeah, the need to know uh, when I talk about the active learning cycle, is that tomorrow or I don't remember about the schedule? Uh, Amy, I can see Amy's checking because I don't even have the schedule handy. But in the active learning cycle, we talk a lot about the need to know. And, um, and if you're thinking about attending, I promise you it'll be shorter than this one. It'll be Friday. So Friday, Friday. Morning, it's a promise that it will be shorter. So everybody <laughs> yeah. hold it there. I pro Since I have just a moment, I just want to make a, the teaching center has um, 10 copies of this book, Small Teaching Online. And we're going to try to do a book club this fall. And all you need to do is email the teaching center. And if you are at all turned off by the online part of it, I would say the book is more teaching through an online perspective than it is online online application through a teaching perspective. And I enjoyed the book enough that I bought the small teaching, which is that it was based on. And this Flower Darby here kind of took this idea and sort of extended it. So if you're kind of sitting there thinking, I don't want to do this because I only teach one online class, I assure you that you will find some value for all of your classes, even though it is an online focus. So if you want to participate in that book club and have more conversations like this uh, with a group of your peers, shoot an email to the teaching center. Um, sales pitch. <laughs> If I'm happy to stick around and talk about this if anyone has any questions, um, but as always, I never want to be disrespectful of people's time. So thank you so much, everyone. I am stopping.